restore Lord, make us free. Thank you. Um, um, Elder Jobin, you can you can give me a go ahead for what should be done next. But as I wait for that, we will do um, hymn number uh, fifty. Abide with me. Hymn number fifty. It is the hymn, Abide with me. Abide with me. Abide with me, fast falls the even tide. The darkness deepens, Lord, with me abide. When all the hell hearts fail and comforts me, help of the helpless soul, abide with me. Swift to its close, ebbs out life's little day. Earth's joys grow dim, its glories pass away. Change and decay in all around I see. Oh, the who changes not abide with me. I need thy presence every passing hour. Watch, but thy grace can foil the tempter's power. Who like thyself? My guidance day can be through cloud and sunshine, oh, abide with me. I feel no foe with the art hand to bless. Tears no bitterness when his destiny will grant the victory. I triumph still if thou abide with me. Amen. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, we'll go on to uh, the next. Yeah. Thank you very much. Let us just be patient. I'm still confirming if our speaker is here with us. Uh, so let's be patient as more teams. So, Joan, I kindly continue. Okay, so um, the next song I will do is Hiding in the um, hymn number 320. So I think I got the number wrong. 525, Hiding in the 525. Oh, save to the rock that is higher than I. Oh, save to the rock that is higher than I, my soul in its conflicts and sorrows would lie, so sinful, so weary, thine, thine would I be. 
Thou blessed Prokofiev, I'm hiding in thee, hiding in thee, hiding in thee. Thou blessed Prokofiev, I'm hiding in In sorrow's blown arm, in times when temptation cast o'er me its power, in the tempest of life on its wide heaving sea, the blessed rock of ages. I'm hiding in thee, hiding in thee, hiding in thee. The blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding in thee. How oft in the conflict when Pressed by the foe, I fled to my refuge and breathed out my woe. How often, when trials like sea billows roam, have I hidden in thee, O thou rock? Hiding in thee, hiding in thee, the best of all ages. I'm hiding in thee. Thank you. Amen. Eh, unaskia bini njoana na imba bizi. Yeye inge kwa nyes angema education. Yeah. Hey. I didn't know that's a hey, people. Are you hearing me? People. Hey. Right and yes, I'm a penanga to congam. Hey, we are going. I know that's a person. Okay. Do I still do another song? Okay. I see. Someone. Yes, yes, kindly. Okay. I see someone has suggested him number 343, but she'll forgive me. Um, I am not quite conversant with that song. So we'll do him number 495, near to, um, near to the heart of God, sorry, of 434. Four thirty-four. Or okay, try to get it. Four thirty-four. We speak of the realm. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. We speak of the realms of the blessed, the country so bright and so fair, and of its glories confessed. But what must it be to be there? We speak of its pathway of gold, its walls that kept you so rare, its wonders and pleasures and toad. But what must it be to be there? We speak of its freedom from sin, from sorrow, temptation, and care, from trials without and within. But what must it be to be there? We speak of its service of love, of the rose which the glorified were, of the church from the firstborn above. But what must 
wanted me to be there. Our morning is all at an end when raised by the life giving word. We see the new city descend. Our dawn is a bright for the Lord. The city so holy and clear. No sorrow can breathe in the air. No gloom of affliction or sin. No shadow or evil is there. Do thou meet temptation and woe from heaven, my spirit prepare, and shortly I also shall know and feel what it is to be there. The Amen and amen. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sister uh, Joan, for the wonderful piece of music uh, that you have presented to us. May the Lord richly bless you. Uh, so, brethren, a time has come that we are going to listen to our facilitator. Uh, we have waited for him, and I want to uh, thank you all for your patience. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Pastor David o and I'm glad that he's here with us. Uh, just as he had promised yesterday, when we were talking about friendship, dating, and courtship, uh, that he'll be talking about uh, the, uh, last being the problem in our relationship. So I want to uh, welcome him in a special way that he may minister to us just as the Lord will guide him. Uh, so wherever you are, let us pray even as we welcome him. Let us pray. Our Father God, God in heaven, thank you for this evening. A time, Lord, has come that we are going to uh, hear from you, Lord Father. As you are going to speak uh, through your man servant, Lord Father, may you give us your spirit to help us discern, Lord Father, that which you want us to understand and where you want us, Lord, to be. May you use him in a special way, Lord Father. May you tabernacle with us even as we start till the end. It is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so, Amen. Pastor David, uh, yes. please welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Again, I'm really, I don't know whether it's justifiable, but I'm sorry that I've come in late. Um, and I'll be ready. Uh, it just happened that so many things have to be juggled, running from one meeting to another. But I'm here, children of God, and whatever I have for us today, I hope it will just be beneficial to, uh, to you. Uh, I want to request if I could be helped to share um, my screen uh, to us. Okay, thank you so much. So um, allow me just to go without so much introductory issues on the element. Yesterday we dealt with dating. And one of the points that I want us to appreciate as we talk with dating is let not confuse ourselves with the labels what really describes the what we are doing is the lifestyle what we are in the activities are more authentic to tell what is going on than the levels we give them you know you could talk about dating with somebody but in a sense you are courting so let's not be confused by our activity the thing that describes what you're doing is the thing that really describes um your experience is your activity rather than the level you uh, Somebody help us. Okay. You uh, dating is intended to make us acquainted with each other. Now, dating 
as a range. And I said, it's not only when we are still unmarried, but dating goes on even into marriage and courting allows people to select. So that's why I'm saying, if you already have selected, uh, somebody still is coming. So, uh, somebody help us to mute. Okay, thank you. Uh, the reason why I'm saying that your activities tell of what you are going through rather than the label you give it, you give it, is because if you already have selected somebody, you already specialized with somebody, don't call yourself dating, you're already courting somebody. So you need to, you, it's like you're preparing to move on to the next stage, which is engagement, because you have specialized with somebody. Otherwise, if you're dating, then your dating should be essentially a socializing a forum where you get to know many, you get to know yourself as we saw yesterday. So the main thing that happens with dating is you knowing yourself and knowing um, how you respond to certain elements of life rather than just issue of what you're doing uh, because that's where people get confused. So the line between dating and courtship is very thin and that's why we are saying the activities we do are what truly define what it is we are doing rather than the label we give it. You know, people get so caught up with this level. Oh, I'm dating. But in a real sense, they are courting because they're already specialized in a certain way. And that's where also we are caught up in a confusion. And essentially, courting is a more serious relationship than dating. But you find people already caught while they say they are dating. I think we are on the same page. And therefore, uh, remember, as I said yesterday, we need to understand what kind of friendship am I in? rather than just imagining that you're in a friendship, you don't know what kind it is. And sometimes uh, you, and people get hurt. That's why people get hurt because you, you could be thinking, oh, this friendship is steady. Uh, we are moving on somewhere. While somebody's saying, ah, this is just a, a similar agenda we have. Uh, once we are done with the agenda, it's over. We are just constituents. We're just comrades uh, in that sense. So courting is a serious thing. So you can see here that many of us could already be courting the only problem is that <clears throat> if we are in that stage and there is no commitment, somebody is going to be hurt. Somebody is going to be hurt. And I usually say the people who get hurt more, I know men get hurt, but men get over their heart quickly than ladies. Ladies, when they are hurt in these relational issues, it, it, it takes a while. It's something that moves on to another place. So you want to uh, to be very, very concerned about that. So courtship, it's where a partners reserve special attention to an individual during the courtship. So the courtship itself, it depends on individuals that come background. These all come into play as we deal with courtship. So the practice of courtship requires an individual to evaluate every behavior as you are continuing with this special person, ask every question, avoid infatuation, that is essential and physical attraction, uh, focus more on the person's character and don't allow sexual intercourse. Yeah, you know, many of you are living, or a number of you are now living in an environment where uh, these, the, these are gray areas, people will say. Even in church, there are some churches today where sexual intercourse before marriage is, is not a big issue, meaning some people, th it's no problem as long as there's commitment. Uh, places like India, where virginity or being a virgin was a big issue. A recent study that was conducted in some campuses in India, in the city of Pune, Maharashtra, 70% of the college girls signed in that they have no problem with giving away their virginity to a man they consider to be, you know, appropriate. 70%, you know, India is a, a more conservative country where a woman knows the consequences if their virginity is broken before marriage. It means that if that man doesn't marry you, you are done. You'll never be married because any man cannot come to enter in a place where other men has come or walked in. So 70% of ladies say they are ready. So I was saying, if a place where people are so conservative have sold it out in this manner. What about what Africa, where you know uh, sometimes people may have to be given curfew 
uh, to escape, uh, to sell out or to give themselves out in sexual intercourse where there is no commitment. So courtship uh, is a place we need to be very clear that sexual, sexual intercourse is not something for this moment, especially again, I say, ladies, ladies, um, you are the victims in this place because once you allow this to happen, uh, it, it does not only come a thing that happened, you make yourself vulnerable for more, more uh, encounters like this, such that if this relationship breaks up, you will want to enter another one immediately just because you have now, you know, uh, been taken to another place which you consider you don't understand. So speak the truth and be contented when you engage in courtship. <clears throat> now, this is why we talk about courtship and issues of romance. I talked about it the other day, you know, the art of skillful romance. You know, when people are, when people talk about romance, it's like, I want it now, 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 now. That's what romance is all about, you know. But, you know, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 19, 11, a man's wisdom gives him patience. The reason why we are in this counseling or these sessions is to obtain wisdom. And that wisdom is to give us patience. And patience is important, not only in waiting for the right time to start relationship, but also in allowing it to unfold in a healthy pace. So a child of God will say, I wait for you, O Lord, you will answer. Oh Lord, my God, this is what, uh, what would, uh, uh, the contrast. Roman says, let feelings decide what happens. Wisdom leads us to pursue a purposeful relationship. You know, people get so crazy about the term romance as if it has to be, uh, you know, like we see Hollywood presenting it to us. Uh, but for people who are in this forum, I guess, you are desiring something much more uh, rewarding, rewarding. You need wisdom and that's what we can. So um, at times it's like telling people, come, let us drink deep of love until morning. That is what the, the woman says, the, the harlot woman says, let us enjoy our, our, ourselves with love. You know, these are days when people have parties just to have sex. And that is something which abuses our integrity, abuses our own dignity uh, as a person. But this is essentially what romance seems to suggest. Romance is a good word. And that has to lean over what I was talking about last. But the thing is, where it's, what does it satisfy? So what is courtship? It's dating with a purpose. That's, it's dating with a purpose. It's friendship plus possibility meaning we are courting because we see some possibility. It's romance champion by wisdom. That is what I mean. You, uh, that is Harris saying, Joshua Harris. Uh, that it's a clear cause where romance is kept in check because there is a purpose for it going to happen. Another thing about romance that is misplaced in courtship, remember courtship is usually uh, something that is like there is this specific selected person, meaning you have moved from the bar below where you have been friends and you've been socializing. Now you have specialized. Courtship is essentially specializing on a person. So when you are in courtship, you, are, you romance says, enjoy the fantasy. But wisdom calls us to base our emotions and perception, perceptions on reality. You want to think, you know, as I said the other day, you can light fire, the same fire, fire, same fire, not, nothing different, fire. You can light it in the kitchen and cook with it and make food. But if you light fire in a petrol station, there's most likely going to be some combustion. People are going to be burned and consumed. So a romance is not something we neglect in our courtship. It's only that we wait for the right place and the right time. Both areas, it doesn't mean that courtship does not need romance. It's just that courtship gives it protection. Now, let me put it that way. Courtship helps us to give protection 
to our passions. Well, if we are not uh, in a courtship, if we are not in commitment, then we only want to enjoy the fantasy, but that fantasy is not protected. And that means it's dangerous. It means it's, it's like the fire in the petrol station. It's going to consume people. So when you're talking about these elements, we're talking about things God has put in us, but he wants us to uh, utilize them at the right moment. So what is an emotion? Uh, an emotion is a physical expression of how we perceive the status of something that we value. So our sexual desires are indeed things God have given us as a gift. I'll be talking about it a little bit more, but at this place, we just want to understand like anger, gladness, fear, sadness, joy, jealousy, hatred, and all combination of our perception and our values, the same manner it is with our sexual uh, emotions. So Proverbs 19.2 says, it's not good to have zeal without knowledge. I want to replace the word zeal with passion, without knowledge, you know, nor to be hasty and miss the way. That's an element that we also want to appreciate. Another thing is to have to ask myself some questions or we need to ask ourselves, are you ready for courtship? Uh, the problem we see in relationships today is impatience or lack of purpose. And misguided emotions are all expressions that we could say, uh, Joshua Harris rightly said, the boy meets a girl in his book, Hello to Courtship, that it's a misguided emotions and all expressions are ready to be uh, released at the moment that they are felt. So I need to ask, am I prepared to lead my wife spiritually? This is a gentleman and serve her in every way. Or do I have a proven character and I am growing in godliness? These are courtship questions before you begin to specialize on this person. Uh, to whom or for what am I accountable in this relationship? How am I involved in church? Or do I have any uh, institution where I'm accountable? What are my gifts and ministry areas? Because this will give you the opportunities to direct your energy productively, like rather than directing your energy on an individual and thereby find yourself abusing the gift God has given you of sexuality. So courtship is a place of asking, are my motives of pursuing marriage selfish or wildly? Are they to honor God or just to satisfy my own emotions? Can I provide financially? Man, before you specialize and get into this, I know sometimes when this is spoken about, uh, men start thinking that ladies are more, they think about money much more. But even when you look in the beginning, God, before he brought Eve, the Bible tells us he took him into the garden to till the land. So it's not so much about women thinking of money, but of being practical that they need security. And therefore, as a man, I want to think, can I provide? You know, some of these questions are key to us. Um, in the previous years, they may not have been very clear for some of us, maybe for, for lack of instructions, but you are privileged to attend such meetings. You need to take concern uh, of it. And it's not a matter of being a millionaire gentleman, because I know also many young men eventually delay their moments because they're thinking they have to establish financially. It's as long as you're able to make provision. And if you find that your source of income is surely um, uh, secure to keep this relationship, it's good to start off humbly. You start off humbly with a lady, it's most likely that that's going to be a strong family. So that is on both sides. Ladies uh, are practical in the sense they want security from the men that come in their lives. What do my pastors and parents have to say? I usually encounter these questions quite a lot. When am I supposed to tell my parents? And I usually tell people, it's not when, but how did you, how have you been involved in the whole process? Because sometimes I know the big ambush our parents may find themselves in when it seems that everybody, everything is already sealed. 
And then that's when you want to bring it to your parents. We say that the friendships should be well aware. Parents, you, uh, most of you have parents which are now very informed, except for some who just refuse, but some of you have parents who are very informed, who would wish and appreciate to see who are the people in your life. So involve, involve them, involve your parent at certain particular moments like, well, today we were out maybe in a Bible study and so on, so was present. And you know, the parents are wise enough to realize that if a certain name seems to be coming up all the time in activities, maybe there's something coming up. So no much surprise will come along when they have been in the picture of the people in your life. So you don't have to have the big day. Maybe the big day will just be now we are making a decision to tell your mother and father. But if they are somehow in the picture of how your life is evolving, um, and you'll also know their, their proposal because they can tell. They can tell you what's going on way in advance. So courtship is basically something that involves much decision. Now, I want to go straight to sexuality uh, after, after that uh, as, as we move towards the end of this particular session of sexuality with courtship. Please, uh, I hope there are some questions that we can be able to um, uh, to respond to as I change uh, another uh, slide. Um, just a few minutes as I, I change my slideshow here. Right, let me see. Um, what we have to see together. I hope that this will be able to help us in a way. Um, something I had, there's still much more we can look at, but let me just go this. Uh, let's begin at the beginning and see what God intends for us. Let's begin looking at our sexuality from the beginning. In Genesis 1, the Bible tells us God created us in his image. He created him male and female, the imago Dei. That's how God created us, not only men. And therefore, when the Bible tells us the first thing that God created us or purposed sex to be was for procreation. Procreation, that is Genesis chapter 1, 28 says, God created and blessed them and, and say to them, be fruitful and multiply. There is some nuance of sex there. So God designed sex for, for a purpose. You know, people were given that opportunity that sex was to be for procreation, but God didn't intend sex for procreation alone. Uh, we also know that uh, God intended sex not only for procreation, but also for pleasure. Anyway, here I use the word, the word is used intimacy. Uh, verse 8, uh, Genesis 2, 18 to 25 says, and the Lord God said, it's not good that a man should be alone. I'll make for him a helper comparable to him. Success, sex was not made only for procreation, but it was also meant for intimacy. Or if you would want to have a rhyme of membering, you could say for pleasure. So we're beginning to look at sex to be not just something for babies, but also. And in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 11, uh, ne uh, ne nevertheless, neither is a man independent of a woman, not a woman independent of a man in the Lord. So there is an element of intimacy as you look at that. In the same book, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, sex is also said to be intended for people um, you know, for pleasure, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Um, this is also another place where Proverbs 5, uh, 18 to 19, let the fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. Pleasure again, God says in this place, so, uh, you know, unless we first appreciate what essentially sex is, because I told you yesterday, sex is not the problem. God created sex for a gift for people. We've seen he created it for pleasure. He created it for procreation. And also uh, the Bible tells us he designed it within the marriage um, environment because that's where it is protected. You know, every good thing needs to be protected. And that's why God says the bed of marriage that fornicators and adulterers will be judged by God. 
marriage is honorable. So it's for marriage. Marriage is to give it the protection. And we read also Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 6 to 9. How fair and how pleasant are you, O love, with your delights. This stitch of yours is like a palm tree, and your breasts are like clusters. I said, I will go up to the palm tree. I'll take hold of your branches. Let now your breasts be like, you know, you know, people sometimes as they get into Hollywood so much, they imagine that uh, being a Christian makes you a lousy partner. But listen to these words. See how the Bible itself is so romantic that any man can still or any woman can still appreciate being in relationship. Sex began with God. That is essentially what it is. And it was designed without shame. The Bible tells us they were told, they said that the woman and the man were naked and they were not ashamed. Sex is not to be for shame. Where does shame come from? Shame comes when it is not in the environment that God intended it to be. So um, we all have heard about the scandal of Clinton, which passed by. And I usually appreciate the scandal of Bill Clinton and Monica uh, with the sex, sex scandal. One thing is to applaud Clinton when he gave that uh, televised statement saying that he had improper physical relation with Lewinsky. And then thereafter, he was impeached by the House of Representative. representative. But one preacher, um, I will say something about this, that Clinton stood courageously in acknowledging this. So uh, in all this situation, we see now sex has shame. What was shame? Why was it shame? Clinton was a mature man. Monica was a mature man. But what made this sex experience to be one of shame? It's because it happened in the wrong place. Clinton was married uh, to Hillary and Monica uh, coming into their life was totally a thing. And there we see now sex is not about sex. So sex is not the problem here, but it's about people who are caught up in their lust, you see, and selfishness, especially with Clinton. So uh, taking advantage of Monica in this, in this place. So sex is not a problem that God, we see other uh, uh, politicians also that have been brought. This is abroad, but we know we, we have many, many other, even here at home, uh, we have had many of these problems. So God created sex for good, but the thing that have made sex to be a problem is the last of people. So husbands are designed to be people of strength. The Bible says in 1 Peter 3, 7, likewise husband, and I'm speaking to a youth, I appreciate that, but I know many of you are men. It's good to be informed early enough that husband likewise dwell with them with understanding, give, giving honor to the wives as weaker vessels and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may be hindered. Now, I want to make an application on this text. It's given for men, husbands, but they can apply for men as as young men. Why? Because young men at times blackmail their sisters. The Bible says, live with your sisters with understanding. The blackmail appears in this manner. Our sisters appreciate our relationships. But sometimes when our relationship is put on the line in the sense like they have to prove, I want to tell my young brothers, that if you are privileged to have a sister in your life, you want to be sure that they are uh, a large number. I know some of them also could be corrupted, but I know a large percentage of these young sisters that you have within you. If you are privileged to have one in your life, you don't, have any, you don't need any guarantee that they mean to be good friends. They don't need to be you know, blackmailed, that they have to prove that they truly are are, are friendly, you know, sometimes people say, prove whether you love me. And this is where the strength of the man is shown. There is that emotional vulnerability that the sisters have, uh, which put them in an awkward situation, especially when they're with their brothers. 
And this comes about with many, many of you are scientists. I will not belabor many of these things, but men and women define every cell of their bodies. This difference in the chromosome combination, in the basic course of development, in the maleness and femaleness. This is key, especially when we come to boy-girl relationship. These are key. A woman has a greater constitution vitality, perhaps because of he, these chromosomes. Normally, they outlive the men. Um, the elements of high emotional elements, uh, emotional body, are quite, in, uh, are quite interesting. There's a skeleton structure of a woman and the, the larger stomach, kidney, all these things contribute to a large extent to high emotional buildup. I don't want to get into the very scientific, scientific, but a woman's unique function totally lacking in men is menstruation, pregnancy, and lactation. Now, all these influence the behavior and feelings. And that's why, ladies, the most vulnerable times for you to be out with a gentleman are during some of these changes that happen in your life. You know, like when you have started to, to, to menstruate, you know, when menstruation, there are periods as a lady, as a young girl, that when you find yourself with a man, your hormones are more easily excited. Yeah. The same glands behave differently in the two, two sex, uh, sexes, that's a male and a female. So uh, when you are um, exposing yourself during a certain period of these cycles as a lady, uh, these are the points where you find yourself vulnerable and you find yourself maybe, um, you know, engaged in what you could not have planned to find yourself doing. So these physical differences are significant and key for us in understanding our sexuality. The female blood contains more water, actually 60% fewer red blood cells. Uh, since these supply oxygen to the body, she tires more easily, she's more prone to faint, and this constitution constitutes our vitality. Now, I don't want to get into this very, very deep things, but the thing I want us to appreciate that these physical differences contribute a lot to how the lady will be able to withstand, especially when she stands before a young man who is not protecting or showing strength. The things of breathing and all this, um, and I use this in a different setting, but for us, the thing I think that is quite significant is to understand the woman's need of taking care of herself in certain circles of her life. But there's also an element when we talk about issues of marriages, which we may not have time to talk in this, but I'll say it here, females mature faster than males. And uh, it makes them more intelligent at times than the male partners. That's why the encouragement is given for a male to look for a lady who is younger. It doesn't mean there are some, ex the, the, some exceptions don't happen, but yeah, this is one very fundamental issue. So um, for male, um, when you look at how the boys tend to package in different hemisphere, for their verbal tasks, the left verbal task that they use, but in girls, non-verbals and verbal skills are likely to be found on both sides of the brain. This is the reason why ladies are considered to be more, have a, an intuition, I mean, being able to make a decision without much details of thinking. But this affects their actions and also their reaction. So um, have you ever wondered why some ladies, especially young girls or ladies, when they, you get pregnant before you're married, it's easy to get pregnant again. Uh, it's all because of these hormonal you know, cycles and the reason why somebody needs to be away. Um, this is, I'm, I'm highlighting the things I think that are quickly going to be in your context. Girls have a more skin sensitivity, particularly in their fingertips and more proficient at the fine motor performances. So I thank God sometimes for COVID that has stopped giving us social distancing because some ladies were waylaid in that sense, you know, they give themselves away, hugged so tightly by, late, by gentlemen, not realizing that your skin tight and some of you have sleeveless. So you don't know what's happening. You just feel like you are 
moving into another sphere of life. But these are elements where sometimes we find ourselves compromising or even just a handshake where somebody's on your hand for a while and then you just find yourself beginning to be more weak. Uh, so girls are more attentive to social context, meaning faces, speech patterns, and subtle vocal cues. Uh, ladies are more um, vulnerable to what they hear uh, than what they see. So while girls speak more and speak sooner, and they are more with more vocabularies, um, uh, this is quite related to why they're also drawn to men um, who talk a lot or to talk much better. That's why, again, when I say this, for men who probably are always up front, like preachers or performers, uh, they also may find themselves sometimes um, you know, in trouble because some ladies, while they appreciate your gift, may also just find themselves attracted to you. And that's why sometimes boys also would find themselves in trouble. Uh, boys have a better total body combination, but poorer in detailed hand activity. That's, that's why they don't engage so much in some of those cloth stitching and all that. Um, these are some things which may not be relevant for us, but um, let me just move ahead. Girls who are assertive and active and can control events have greater intellectual development. Boys are more hyperactive when it comes to issues that they have to handle, especially when they're dealing with ladies. And uh, because the male brain is primarily visual, that's why you find that we are more inclined to see how ladies are dressed and get manipulated. Uh, you know, and you can see it also demonstrated by the way ladies also are putting more focus on how much of their body they show because, you know, sometimes the powers that are operating in our lives are different. So the ladies will try to be more obvious uh, in the dress. Uh, you can see trying to expose their hinds, their breasts, because the man, male brain is more primary visual. Now, that doesn't give anybody an excuse for doing anything, uh, but it's just to understand, like, for sisters taking good care of uh, the boys in their lives. Um, we have talked about dating and enlargement, but I want to bring something here. The boy can see how the brain, what large percentage of your mind is on sex. That's why many of our gentlemen get caught up in pornography because you can see how um, generally our head or brain, uh, the sex images are more likely to have a place to occupy. You know, we're talking about sexuality and other elements of abuse of sexuality, and the things that promote lust. So when a young man, is exposed to things like pornography, it's very hard to break the, uh, the habit or even other dangerous uh, behaviors because of the kind of the setup of the brain. I want to, um, to bring, um, God created us with the distinctions for our purpose. He didn't create us with the distinction just to abuse, but he created us with the distinction because he intends every one of us to play a certain role in that sense. So um, the roles we can see God talking about the woman submitting to a man, but those are topics that I don't want to cover now. I just want to tell you our differences are intended for roles. You are a woman, you're a lady, because God wants you to play a role. You can see that from the beginning, talking about sex, sex is not a problem because God has a purpose for it. But just like medicine, we talk about medicine being abused. We use cocaine inside um, a theater when somebody has to be made nub to take an operation. But when you're found with cocaine in the streets, that same good thing is abused. So sex is good when it is in its rightfully place, but sex outside its rightful place is an abuse. The same thing a lady created not to be an object of a man, but created to the glory of God. But it doesn't mean that the features of a woman are intended to attract lust. 
when God created a woman, he created it with all intentions to be attractive. I, I usually tell people, in fact, the word God uses to create a woman is actually uh, to build. It's a word that is different from bara, the word used to create a man. A man was more or less like put together, but a woman was for real. God took time. It was, the word used for a woman's creation was more of, it was an act of work. So every feature of a woman is all intended to do what it does when it's rightly utilized. Even though women, again, uh, carry it to another level and abuse it. But we are trying to say that if we allow the things God has gifted us, beginning with sex, beginning with our bodies, for the rightful purposes, nothing is a problem. The problem begins when we don't understand some of these purposes and we start thinking that, well, everything is wrong. No. God gave us sex, as I said, for procreation, gave us sex for pleasure. Another thing, sex was given for purity. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 2 to 4, the Bible says, nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due to her and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife has. So this is in the context of marriage where we see the depiction that God wants sex to be pure. And purity of sex is when it happens within the marriage setup. Now, this is where we're talking about last sexual perversion. Sexual perversion, there are several names about sexual perversion. One is called adultery. Now, uh, pokia. This is a word that nowadays people don't want to use. They call it extramarital affair, just to give it a reason to exist. That is just something happening out of a marital setting. But the Bible calls it adultery and lawful intercourse with or by a, a spouse of another. And then the Bible also calls sexual perversion. Another one is called fornication, ponea. This is an immoral sexual intercourse prostitution or halatory. Uh, these are sexual perversion that are expressions of lust. And the other one is, the Bible tells us that God said, you shall not commit adultery. Let the world not cheat us that it's just an extramarital affair. It's permissible. The world, the Bible says, thou shall not commit adultery. Marriage is honorable among all and people should not defile the bed of marriage. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Now, other works, this is, this is the place I wanted us to pay attention. It's called unclean, uncleanness, uh, which is moral impurity. Now, this is key because many people get involved here. And recently I was in a presentation where people had issues when I said about this. But this sexual uncleanness, you can read it in Galatians, what does it mean? Uncleanness, what does this mean? Akatharisia, what does it mean? The thing it means, sexual uncleanness means um, a, a stimulation of sexual desires that are not consummated. Let me repeat that. This word here means sexual uh, stimulation that are not actualized. Where do we find some of those things? Some of those things are what we talk about masturbation, you know, where people stimulate themselves sexually and are, do not actualize them as they are intended. So uh, this is the place where also we find some of the questions people ask uh, that, is it okay to kiss with somebody? Uh, all the same for the sake of it. Like in college, I remember I used to be asked whether it's okay to just tell my boyfriend, girlfriend, good night with a kiss or a peck, they call it, or some people call it necking. Now, this is where these things fall. In all these instances, in most, uh, it occurs that there is a sexual stimulation 
which is not actualized. So the Bible calls it uncleanness and cleanness. This is part of the works of the flesh. This wise man, in looking at pornography, which is also another place where people stimulate sexual, um, sexual feelings and they don't actualize them. Uh, it's more a thing that deals with the brain. And uh, today we watch YouTube, you'll see many presentations regarding uh, how the brain is affected by the, uh, pornography. So watching two hours of violence in a movie has no influence on our behavior. But 30 seconds of Super Bowl ad is worth 3.8 million because it makes us run out and buy a product. You will find that when you keep yourself on a Super Bowl or even a pornography, pictures of nude and people engaged in sex, your brain is affected at a larger, larger extent. So you want to be uh, careful. Violence movies it, are not excluded, but in contrast to what sexual stimulating pictures can activate in an individual's brain, in contrast to violent movie is seen to be at a greater extent. Uh, we want to appreciate that even as we watch pornography, we are actually promoting certain activities, especially for kids who are put into these pictures and also the image of a woman who is also exposed to such pictures that we are watching. As young people, we are called upon to be custodians of what is right and what is true. There's another word also the Bible uses, which is called lasciviousness in the same book, Galatians. This is sexual immorality without shame. This is where people get into absence of restraint, uh, you know, shamelessness, no longer hiding, but openly pursuing the sin without shame of being seen, behavior which becomes like an animal. Now, many of you young people, I don't know where you are, you are at this moment, but there's something which is becoming an in thing in towns today where people can get together, boys and girls in the same room, and people just have sex. Now, the Bible calls this lasciviousness. Uh, this is a promotion of sex, a promotion of lust that I guess the Bible would not wish those who are informed to get involved. So um, uh, we don't want to get in some of these things which are far from us, but when you look around in our lives, the Bible has condemned lust in this demonstration, lasciviousness, uncleanness, adultery, fornication, pornography, masturbation, these are the, the problem. When we fornicate, we are actually promoting lust, but God with sex has no problem. That was my uh, thesis for this presentation today regarding sex, sexuality, and I hope that it gives us some light on what's going on, especially understanding our anatomies, our bodies, and knowing that we need to appreciate them God has not given them to us as tools to be used, uh, even when we are feeling those things. Those feelings are actually put in by God, and they can well be managed and controlled. As the Bible says, don't awaken them before their time. Otherwise, God could not have made us slaves to the feelings that can kill us. I want to stop there. If there could be, we have maybe like 10 minutes for question answers. Uh, this is usually an interesting uh, topic when people begin to discuss it. Let me return it to our coordinator and see whether we can respond to some questions and answers. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Pastor David, uh, for the wonderful session that that we have had. Uh, may the Lord richly bless you. It has been uplifting. Uh, so, as Pastor has said, uh, if you have a question uh, for the next 10 minutes, I think a Pastor can handle the questions before uh, we bid each other goodbye. Uh, so, let me just confirm my chat box if there may be any question that has been sent. Uh, it looks like there is none. Uh, so, let me give this room for anyone who has a question 
uh, you may opt to raise up your hand or unmute yourself that I may give you the opportunity to ask your question. So if you have a question, kindly. Okay. Uh, let me just respond to a question that I'm receiving now that someone has say ask uh, will allow me to make it private, but it could help somebody um, because I know it's true. There is a thing about dating and courting. Um, if you read one book by Sister White, she encourages that we not engage ourselves in long time um, courtships because we are more likely to fall into these pitfalls of sexual perversion because you know you will have to have reasons for why you are together uh, that's why uh, you know it's good to continue being generally together I know that is not easy especially in our time today but if you are going to keep three four years of courtship then it's most likely that you'll fall into the temptation of trying to give expression. Remember, we are human. Expression to your um, sexual uh, feelings. So it's good for you uh, to ensure that if you are going to do anything with, um, uh, with your courtship, uh, it should begin when it has a purpose of an end in, in, in the end. In, in, you know, but when it's not yet still clear where we are going, that's where we fall into this temptation. So I think many of, we, of us could be in that position. Uh, I cannot give a clear answer of what we need to do, but probably just need to be very sure that if I start specializing with someone, I am quite certain that this is moving somewhere at a particular time in our lives. Our college life is essentially given for us to get to know people and uh, towards, as we probably are looking at the end, uh, we can already begin to know who is who in our circle. And those are the people without being very, um, very explicit trying to know, to tell that this is the person that I would wish eventually uh, to see whether I can pursue. Um, because this is where we find pornography coming into the picture because since maybe we are good Christian, we don't want to maybe offend our sister or brother. So the best exit for those sexual feelings are usually done in pornography. But pornography is a powerful tool that sometimes the only way to break it is even to just get offline for a while. It just, they say it's like alcohol because once you start it, it's like you're drinking alcohol, it's addictive. So you have to take some radical decisions and uh, just keep off. Remember, the Bible tells us uh, that we should not behold evil. Uh, so it, it I had to acknowledge it's something which is powerful. And once you fall into it, it can really ruin you. And it requires a strong submission to the good things of God. You don't have to fight it because fighting it is a losing battle. What you need to do is fill your life with the things of God, the good things. Fill your life with good things and it will naturally die out of your life. If you confront it, you can't manage it. It's just going to put you down all the time. The best way, as the Bible says, follow the spirit and the fleshy things will die. Yeah, that's what I see. I think... I think... Okay, somebody has also asked about masturbation, whether it has a spiritual impact. Certainly, yes. One of the things is every master, every instance masturbation, uh, they, okay, scientifically, that is left for science to give you the, the best evidence. Uh, one loses electrons of the brain. And now, you know, as a spiritual individual, you need your brain. That's the reason why sometimes even... Um, vegetarianism is promoted because it enables a proper blood circulation to enable the brain to perceive things of God. If you are given to masturbation, it means that your brain will be taxed. And in that sense, your brain will be weakened and you will not have the stamina to perceive spiritual things. That is the spiritual impact that we have on that. Um, 
So um, thank you. I'm not in any way. I'm, I guess some of the questions are good for me, but I know there are many people could be suffering and not just coming out. Uh, no. Okay, Pastor, uh, before, before you leave, uh, there are some uh, questions that I'm receiving uh, privately. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them, if you may just re respond to them, is that uh, nowadays, these are questions that someone is sending to me privately. Nowadays, the trend is people staying together, then assuming it is marriage or just visiting parents, and mm -hmm. that's it. My question is, uh, is does, does marriage have to be done in the church for it to be holy? Uh, someone is asking that question. Then there is also someone else then is asking that how can we help people who have been engaging in sex before marriage and they are planning to marry each other and and to some point a partner is not willing to stop so that's the second question and maybe the last question is there a way the last question uh is there a way to resist uh, sexual sin amongst the youth especially adventist youth so, Pastor, maybe before you leave, you can respond to these yeah, sure. questions. Um, I have to say that, again, sex, and that's why I say in most instances when people engage in sex, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to break. And mostly the people I, 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 I pity, let me say, are, are girls. Because, you know, when you engage yourself in sex, you give your, yourself away. And that's why you find yourself desperately in need of this young man or boy who is in your life because they take away part of you. And that's why you find yourself uncontrollably still wanting to engage yourself in sex. And that's why I said at the beginning that the, the ladies who start it, sometimes it becomes very difficult to break it because you lose part of your own self. You know, the Bible tells us every other sin we do is outside us, but the sin of sexual immorality is a sin against your own self. And that's what happens. So one good news is this, ladies should not get uh, frustrated and desperate to break up the habit because it's possible to regain your virginity as a woman, it's possible. And the virginity that is restored is not only the virginity of the body, but your heart virginity. So you don't have to throw yourself in a desperate way uh, because you started it and now it's like you're helpless over it. You can give hope to yourself. God has a way in which he can make a woman who has been used sexually to regain his own um, uh, virginity that has been broken. The heart virginity, which for me is significant than the body virginity. So, and that is why we are called to follow the spirit. And as I said, with pornography and masturbation, uh, these are not things you resist. You don't resist the sexual sin. You cannot overcome it. But go back to Galatians that we read. The Bible says, follow the spirit and then your fleshy desires will die. You only need to see which path to follow the spirit, be it a meeting, having people who are talking about issues of God or, um, you know, feeding your soul with spiritual things will help you. Coming off steamy movies that will just essentially stimulate your sexual desires and make you vulnerable for them. So I know, and it is true, as somebody has rightly asked, many of us as young people, are taking advantage of being in the church to engage in sexual activities. And since nobody knows about it, we think we'll go out with it. The problem is we are destroying our own dignity, especially for ladies. We are making ourselves lose our value. And, you know, you will just find yourself not, you know, thinking that any people are against you or not appreciating you. But in a sense, it's you who has destroyed your own person by allowing yourself to engage in this sexual activity. So the thing is, the, 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 the small answer that I want to say, as a woman, follow the spiritual things 
and you will kill the sexual desire. Don't waste your energy. You cannot like, okay, today I'm like biting my teeth. I want to stop it. Make the decision that I want to fill my life with spiritual things. And as you fill your life with spiritual things, you will be transformed in your mind, in your heart. And you'll find that the spiritual things, sexual things and fleshy things die naturally. Um, that's what I would say. I don't know whether you could remind me the other question. Uh, uh, please. Um, yeah, somebody's requesting for this. I'll try and send it to Brian, uh, my presentations, uh, so you can utilize them maybe to share. Um, um, okay, somebody's asking some, but something about kissing. kissing. Um, okay, now, I know when I was a chaplain in Nairobi University, I remember I handled many issues of cohabiting, which starts by probably somebody cooking for someone and then eventually they stay together. Um, our counsel is usually that if you are maybe dating, please don't allow yourselves to be together, two of you alone. You are giving yourselves away. Um, just try to be in the company of many so that you don't fall into that Ali husband wife relationships, which will leave you helpless. I'll say helpless because when schools are closed and people have to go back and you've been used to that life of husband wife, you are helpless. And the gentlemen also, you know, when you put your sister into that kind of condition, you know, I'm, I talk about gentlemen, while we are the weaker ones, especially when ladies are open to the act, but we can uh, be also the leaders by not allowing ourselves to start going on that path. Ladies don't go onto that path easily, but when they are already vulnerable in a relationship, they are most likely going to fall into that path. So the gentleman can help them. Yeah. How long should one heartbroken take before engaging in another one? Well, it depends on individuals. We can't put the time, but depending on the relationship and how much the relationship had gone, if people had already engaged in sex, for sure, the heartbrokenness will take a longer time to heal but yes, it does heal, and God is able to restore your heart. Um, um, okay, some of you have requested to privately share with me. I uh, will be free. My number is always available. Um, um, okay, um, okay, somebody is from China following up. I'll definitely share with you also my material. Um, okay, there's one, marriage. does marriage have to happen in church? Now, marriage is not a private activity. One, marriage is before God, who is a witness. The church stands as a representative of God. God will not appear in person, but the members, the church members who are there are the ones who stand in as witnesses of God in the church. The church is more or less the members that come to be with us. So the holiness of marriage is not necessarily the building and the people. The holiness of marriage are the people who are involved. I guess that's quite well taken. It's not holy because you've gone to a big church. It's holy because you too have kept yourselves holy. That's what makes that marriage holy. Because we know many people engage in sex and come to church and think that's what makes it holy. No, the holiness of marriage is, uh, is given by the people engaged in that holiness. Now, that doesn't mean that if you have already engaged in sex, that marriage cannot be holy if you repent. Our God, as we know, is a gracious God. He will forgive and he will allow your marriage again to be restored. As I said, he can make you a virgin again. And make you acceptable to him. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Pastor, for the wonderful uh, uh, illustration and wonderful message that you've given us since yesterday and this evening. May the Lord richly bless you and use you more and more to inspire young people 
and to lead them into a dating uh, or being in a relationship that will glorify uh, the Almighty God. Uh, so, brethren, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, each and every person for finding time to join in. Uh, today we were more than 120 participants. Uh, may you all be blessed. And the messages that